the term romantic wild being very useful for a book and the platform that I set out to build for this broader community, we realized it's too controversial or it's too polarizing. You know, there, there's some people who read it as like the HR department's like, oh no, we don't want to be romantic. That's right. Really <laughs> so don't want to go there. And right, beautiful right, right. is just the broader canvas. It's, I mean, everybody wants to live a beautiful life. Everybody wants beauty. Like no one would ever raise their hand and say, no, I'm not interested in beauty. So it struck us as a really great kind of projection feel. And the house, we felt like, yeah, we want to have a home for that. So a sense of belonging. But why we were tempted, we, thank God, I think we never really fell prey to this desire to build something robust or you know, an actual house, a physical building. So I think the house is really a metaphor and it must remain virtual. I'm Brandon Vaidinathan, and this is Beauty at Work, a podcast about how beauty shapes our world and the work that we do. In this season, we're looking at beauty in science, sponsored by Templeton Religion Trust and the Institute for Advanced Catholic Studies at the University of Southern California. More about them later in the show. Hey everybody, welcome. Thanks for joining us. I am so thrilled to introduce my guest today, Tim Liebrecht. He's a German-American author and entrepreneur and the co-founder and CEO of The House of Beautiful Business. It's a global think tank and community with a mission to make humans more human and business more beautiful. Previously, Tim served as the chief marketing officer of NBBJ, a global design and architecture firm. And then he was, from 2006 to 2013, he was the chief marketing officer of product design and innovation consultancy, Frog Design. Tim is the author of the book, The Business Romantic, which was released in 2015, and it's been translated into nine languages or more to date. And uh, his writing regularly appears in a number of publications like Entrepreneur, Fast Company, Forbes, Fortune, Harvard Business Review, and so on. And his second book, The End of Winning, was released in German in 2020. And Tim is working on a new book, which he'll tell us today. Tim, thank you so much for joining us. It's such a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks so much, friend. It's great to see you again. I'm really happy to be here. Great. Tim, let's Start with your background, with your childhood growing up. What role did beauty play in your life? Because uh -huh. you have you have a mix of, uh, you know, an artistic and business background, right? Your grandfather, I think, was a filmmaker, and your father a businessman, and then you were a musician. Could you, um, yeah, if you could just talk through what role beauty played in your life through through all of that? Yeah, no, it's funny you ask that question, Brent, because I'm actually in my my father's in my parents' house near Stuttgart in the south of Germany. So you can see actually, if I get out of the way, you see some. Oh, you wow. see some uh, uh, photos on the wall, and one of them actually, yeah. I, you can't probably see it, but uh, one of them shows me playing the guitar because I um, played in a band called Migraine. The music was anything but Migraine-esque. It was, it was much more sort of very mellow, chanson, uh, oh, soft okay. jazz, <laughs> singer-songwriter, Tom Waits kind of stuff. Oh, uh, lovely. When I was, I think I was 21, 22, 23 or so, we released two albums, actually, and I sang and played the guitar. It was, it was a wonderful time. That was the first time I think I ever like really pursued something artistic. But even when I was younger, during my teenage years, I I always wanted to be a curator, uh, a publisher. I created fictitious magazines, fictitious TV shows. I did some fake sports commentary. You know, I had a whole publishing group, an empire, in fact. Oh. <laughs> wow. I, wow. And and I was always very interested in music and just creating stuff, you know, creating other worlds, creating experiences. And it's funny that it, I came back to that just a few mm -hmm. years ago or six years ago when I created the house, uh, co-founded the House of Beautiful Business. I grew up in a, in a very suburban uh, middle class kind of town near near Stuttgart, which is, you know, the home is home to Daimler and Porsche and a lot of industry, mm -hmm. automotive industry, Bosch. It's not particularly, I mean, I have to be careful being in my parents' house here, but it's not a part of the world that people would, you know, on the on the surface call particularly beautiful or idyllic. Uh -huh. Although it is very interesting, very Calvinist. And there's mm. been a lot of philosophers, you know, from here, the car was famously invented here by Carl Benz and Gottlieb Daimler, um, the namesake mm. patron of Daimler. So there's a lot of history here. And it's a very industrious sort of uh, Calvinist ethos, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. but also very creative. So that's that's how I grew up, in a, in a very safe, you know, nothing to worry about, very privileged middle-class 
German uh, yeah. family. But my mother, my late mother, was probably the one who brought me to the arts and took me to c- classical concerts and ballet and mm. sort of introduced me to the, you know, the beauties of a, of a sentimental education and the arts and the knowledge that these arts contain. And then I studied law. I mean, I, I just kind of shortened the, the long story, but I studied law. And then through some digressions, I ended up actually in marketing. And then marketing, to me, was like the most creative discipline of business. So from, mm. from there, then I, I worked for a design firm in Silicon Valley, you know, for seven years, wrote my book. And I kind of home, like, came back to my beginnings and the things that I was interested in when I was a teenager. And I wrote The Business Romantic and then uh, co-founded The House of Beautiful Business. And now I'm doing exactly, funny enough, I'm 51 I'm doing exactly what I wanted to do when I was 16, but it's taken me 30 years, you know, at least to, to, I think, muster the courage and acknowledge that that's, that's really what I need to do and nothing else. What was it that you were trying to do when you were 16? I mean, you had this publishing empire, you were curating, could you you say a bit more about what was that? What was the seed there? I think the seed was, um, I mean, I read a lot when I was, uh, you know, a teenager. I was very much into art house movies and the French Nouvelle Vague and independent movies Mm. and uh, James Joyce. You know, I I never read Ulysses. Like, I I read the the monologue of Molly Bloom, the very end of it, and I read short stories, but never the full book. But I was was a very sort of heady, you know, child. And I I had friends, but I was also kind of a loner. And so I I, I think I just sat in my room and created my own worlds. And I wrote a lot. Mm. I wanted to become a writer. And I wrote screenplays and, you know, and movies. And but it was all sort of fictitious stuff, right? I had a radio show that my poor little brother had to be a guest on. (laughs) 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 So it's funny how I mean, it was a very imaginative child in a way. And, And then, you know, this is sort of I guess Sarah Ken Robinson's thesis, right? So the the we then lose this imagination of a child through our education and mm. sort of this rationalist view that is impressed on us, and then it takes quite some time to to rediscover it. Yeah, talk about the um, the origins of your sort of romantic uh, the, the ethos in your life. I mean, did you is that was that was that a word that you sort of identified with at a certain mm-hmm. point and say, "Gosh, this is what I am," and this is what expresses what I've been striving to do. And how did that come about? I never really consciously used it until I wrote the book, uh, which ah. was in, in, I think, I think I started writing in 2012. And I remember that moment I was working on the proposal with an editor and my agent. Uh, and this is my first book. And the, the book was supposed to be called chief meaning officer. Thank God. It, you know, didn't, it <laughs> wasn't published with that title in hindsight, but I realized as I was, I was describing the principles of meaning making as they made sense to me in business, in and through business. And it was really an epiphany when I realized that all of these principles give more than you mm-hmm. take, uh, dwell in, in mystery and mystique, uh, honor the silence, um, you know, lose yourself, you know, with lose without losing. So lose yourself, you know, mm-hmm. surrender um, there, there's, there's others. I, I don't even remember them all now, but they were all romantic principles. And it struck me mm-hmm. when I looked at them, it's like, oh my God, these are all tropes of romanticism of the, the arts and literature philosoph- philosophy movement of the, the 18th, 19th century. That was a response yeah. to the enlightenment. And, but I had never used that. It had never articulated that for me before, even though when I was 16, 17, 18, I, I, I think I've always lived my life that way. So our music, mm-hmm. the music we made with, with our band Migraine was very romantic. You know, it was very kind of, uh, uh, it was full of longing and, and heartbreak. Mm-hmm. And, and also I remember the first city that I uh, frequently drove to because it's not that far from my hometown, five, six uh, hour car drive or train ride is Paris. So I went to Paris a lot. Mm-hmm. And Paris, I really um, cherished and loved. You know, for me, it was the, it was just like the most romantic destination and, and an escape from this rather, you know, gray industrial uh, town that I grew up in and sort of the German, you know, what I thought was a very stifling, narrow German psyche at the time. Mm. So, yeah, that's maybe how it all started. Uh, Paris. <laughs> what inspired you to write the book? What prompted that? The book was, I think, the result of many years of suffering. 
in, mm. in business. So, you know, so from law, which I never finished, I never got a degree. Then I studied mm. applied cultural studies, which was a crude mix of Wittgenstein and accounting. Uh, you know, so I had wow. business classes <laughs> and then I had philosophy. It, it was interesting and it was kind of... Mm. It enabled the students to pursue a career in the arts or arts management or marketing. And that's exactly where I ended mm. up. And then I worked in Silicon Valley for a while. It was in the beginning incredibly thrilling and eye-opening and super interesting and competitive. And I, you know, I sort of felt like, oh, my God, I'm, uh, this is sort of the, the, the time of my life, you know. But I, after a while, I became a bit homesick and mm. uh, Silicon Valley became so... Uh, just adamant and, and fervent about dataism and considering data the only truth and this whole idea of solutionism based on this fact that you can engineer anything, right? There's an engineering solution, not only to uh, like a software problem, but a policy problem or mm. a relationship problem. In fact, any problem in the world, that struck me as very myopic. And after a while in business, I think I, I realized, and I remember actually that there was a meeting. I was chief marketing officer at the time of, of uh, the design company's parent group, which was owned by private equity, by KKR, like you know, one of the world's largest private equity firms. They were at least a large investor. And I was in board meetings and I was just so, I loved the... I loved the adventure of it. And I felt like a complete alien and outsider and I loved observing it almost like an ethnographer. But I also thought, oh my God, these guys are brilliant. Uh, they're super smart, but they have absolutely no idea about culture and sort of the, you know, mm. the, 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 sort of the, 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 the tones in between, you know, the nuances and how much damage they're doing also with their number crunching mindset to the, the whims and woes and the nuances of culture and how much value they're actually destroying, you know, by merging companies and behaving that way. So I was, I was sort of in awe, but also completely shocked. And I think that was actually, I think that was the spark for me to say after probably 10 years or so in, in, in executive positions, no, I, I need to now write down my truth. And my truth is actually hearkening back to where I came from. And it's a somewhat European, probably, uh, sentimental, romantic truth. And there is a space where I want to carve out a space for it in business. And that, and, and I had begun to write and give talks. And I also felt encouraged by the fact that, you know, they were resonant. So people just, I, we, you know, it struck a chord or people were interested in these ideas, mm -hmm. which surprised me. And, and so then really, I think gave me the courage to, yeah pursue this book. Yeah. Idea. Wow. Right. Did you, had, had you encountered any examples of, because I mean, often the, the 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 response to to that sort of critique is you're just being sentimental and naive, and business can't really run unless it's mm. really you know Taylorian, right? I mean, I, and I was really struck by the resonances um, in your book and in your talks about how so much of what you were responding to seems like a new Taylorism, right? The the the, mm. the, the, the reengineering and and even the your new book around winning. I don't know. I don't know if that 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 word is is in any way responding to Jack Welch. I mean, he has a memoir called Winning, mm -hmm. or or I think it's a biography mm -hmm. written by his wife. And Welch is, I think, the kind of prototype or the or the the archetype of of this new reengineering, the new Taylorism, right? Really kind of hyper rationalist, very anti humanist in some way, because you know it's that he was called Neutron Jack because he would <laughs> go into buildings and destroy them and leave the people, you know, get rid of the people and leave the building standing like neutron bombs, right? So um so it seems like there's there's this sort of a call for a new romantic movement that that emerges when there is a new rationalism uh that has taken hold. I don't know if that yeah that's that's accurate reading. I think that's quite accurate. And I think that historically always been the case right whenever the pendulum swung to a very rational super optimizing mm -hmm. hyper efficient mindset when it became very binary in that sense there was always this this counter movement that was by by design somewhat subversive mm -hmm. so i think the romantic movement back then and if there is one right now is is coming from the pockets right it's coming from the underground it's not it's not a top down framework you know that is a kind of an ideology it's more like pockets of resistance that also mm. makes it romantic right uh in a way yeah yeah are there and were there examples that had given you confidence that this is actually business can actually work this way it's not just a sort of sentimental reaction but you can actually succeed in business by following these principles did you find any exemplars yeah I mean, I first of all, it was definitely my, the, the company that I worked at at the time, Frog mm. Design, which was founded by the legendary 
German industrial designer, Hartmut Essinger, had worked for Apple in the 80s and 90s. Mm -hmm. And uh, Steve Jobs, you know, and I heard many stories about Steve Jobs because they worked very closely together, is an interesting figure in that regard because he is both, in a way, uh, hyper romantic. Um, you know, because he believes in the invisible, in the interior of products, right, mm -hmm. and, and not necessarily in the in the metrics or the the external metrics at least. But at the same time, he's also like a hyper driven, very rational uh, yeah. business mind, right? So he was able to reconcile both of these somewhat opposing minds and still retain the ability to function. To, to quote uh, Scott Fitzgerald, so Frog was a place like that. It was, uh, mm. and it was very much because of the founder Hardmuth. Uh, it was a very romantic, dramatic place, full of adventure, also dark in a way. You know, so it never. It was very hard to read. Every day when you went there, you know, you didn't know what to expect. Now, that can be very yeah. off-putting and unsettling, but it's also, I think, uh, at least for me at the time, it was a million times more interesting than uh, a work routine that would have been boring and very consistent. Um, so I saw that as, as an example. And I also, for the book, then interviewed, uh, you know, architects, startup founders. I uh, spent time with Priya Parker, the author of the book, The Art of Gathering, which came out many right. years later, who had just started her practice. And we both uh, served on the, the World Economic Forum uh, Agenda Council on Values. And so we had many conversations about, you know, th there was always a conversation about ethics and doing good mm. and conscious capitalism and purpose. But for me, that conversation always struck me as still somewhat technocratic. It was very cold. Yeah. And uh -huh. so I was always looking for the for the intimacy and the, the beauty that, that a novel or a film or any other piece of art might capture and then express that in business. I remember that um, I began to host events. I ran a hackathon uh, that was still a thing <laughs> in, yeah, in the yeah, early yeah. In 2010 or 2011 about uh, that was called reimagining work or so that was with the mm. the world economic forum and some other partners and yeah and i think those were sort of early attempts to to find the soul of business i was inspired by the the works of david white you know the philosopher and poet who has written a lot about um you know corporations and beauty in a way and corporations and and, and meaning um I was attracted by cultures such as Chanel, you know, the fact that they onboard executives through a, a really kind of, yeah, Proustian sentimental education. So really kind of like honing their faculties, you know, their sensibilities, mm. uh, embracing arts and, 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 and reading and interpreting the world and its sublime beauty and developing a, a sensorial apparatus for that rather than just being a skill-based functioning machine. And then once I had that lens on, of course, what happens is you see more and the world is suddenly, you know, appears romantic to you and you see more and more businesses. Um, I remember interviewing the founder of a series called Death Over Dinner that started in Seattle and it became a, a, a movement in the U.S. where people over dinner had conversations about the ultimate taboo, especially at work, which is death and grief and loss. Um, it's also wow. a theme, as you might remember, that we just covered the uh, quite extensively yeah. actually at, at our recent festival so i think all of these things came together and suddenly i realized oh my god like the reality that we were taught that that we were conditioned to embrace as the mainstream reality it's just a narrow slice of what's happening mm. you know people want more there is more and uh and now many years later with the house of beautiful business and our work and the client work that we do but also the festivals and experiences that we put on ourselves that, that's exactly what we want to create. We want to create a space to show that that other side of that the the broader range of emotions of our humanity is possible in business, and and it is. Yeah, yeah. Now, there always be a lot. I mean, there's a lot in the romantic critique. I think that's really important and valuable. I think it needs to constantly be brought to surface. I mean, the work I've done with scientists, in in, in many ways, I think. Um, you know, I've been studying the role of beauty in science, and 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 many many of the critiques of science are, are I think, similar to the critiques of rationalism because they're they're all about the reductionism, right? The stripping away of mystery and of beauty. Uh, Keats, you know, famously complained that Newton had destroyed the the poetry of the rainbow by reducing it to the prismatic colors and so on. And Keats himself was he was a scientist himself, like he wasn't just a naive, you know, sort of wishful thinker like he was himself aware of the power and, and uh, beauty of science and and yet i think he was really concerned about the way in which relying exclusively on that reductive dimension 
can be really problematic. And and I think it's important to, even though you know scientists now have started pushing back and 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 are, are more willing to talk about beauty and science more openly. Um, it's not something they focus on. And I think that's what needs to be brought to light that even in business, even in accounting or even in, you know, in Silicon Valley, that there's a lot that is to be uh, treasured, uh, that that there's a lot of mystery and there's a lot of magic, even in the process of what seems like hyper-rationalist engineering, right? And it seems like your work is trying to shed a light on those aspects of business. Mm-hmm. Um, talk about the the origin of the House of Beautiful Business and 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 even the word beautiful. How did that mm-hmm. come about? Well, I had written this book, The Business Romantic, and it came out in 2015. And um, around the book, I think there was an interest in forming a community. So I wanted to do an event uh, that was really the spark for the first gathering. And my longtime colleague and friend uh, Till Grusch, uh, also a fellow uh, German. Uh, we, you know, our paths crossed again just at the right time. So we decided to, to do a gathering in Barcelona in Spain. Hmm. And initially we wanted, to, the idea was really to, to create the most romantic business conference that the world had ever seen, like silent dinners, opera singers, uh, silent dinners, opera singers, uh, exhibitions, uh, very different kind of programming, but still, and this is, I think, a hallmark of the house, hopefully, bridging back to the pragmatic and and day-to-day needs of business. So we, we, you know, we don't want to be completely woo-woo and out there, but we want to bring fringe and unorthodox ideas to an orthodox space and uh, without alienating, I guess, the people who attend. Mm -hmm. And for that very reason, I think the term romantic while being very useful for a book and the platform that I set out to build for this broader community, we realized it's too controversial or it's too polarizing you know there, there's some oh. people who read it as like hr departments like oh no we don't want to be romantic that's like right, that's right. All right. <laughs> so don't want to go there and right, beautiful right, is right. just a broader canvas it's i mean everybody wants to live a beautiful life everybody wants beauty mm-hmm. like no one would ever raise their hand and say no i'm not interested in beauty so it struck us as a really great kind of projection feel and the house we felt like yeah we want to have a home for that so a sense of belonging but why we were tempted, we thank God, I think we never really fell prey to this desire to build something robust or, you know, an actual house, a physical building. So I think the house is really a metaphor and it must remain virtual. And so we meet every day, every day, every day, the team meets every day, every, every once a year we meet, you know, the, we, we host a big festival. We've now moved to, yeah. to, to Portugal uh, we did one online during COVID, and then we have a number of online sessions. And we now call ourselves the the network for the life centered economy, which is a term that we didn't invent. It's been around since the Club of Rome discussions, and but it's so relevant and urgent now, and it's a good one. And it means that we want to create a business, and this is maybe the definition of beautiful business. It's a business that honors all life around us and all life inside us which uh, brings to mind emotional diversity, cognitive diversity, cultural diversity, uh, more inclusive, more fluid, uh, more more deeper manifestations of creativity and innovation and, and value creation than the very reductionist sort of movement and management theory have sort of mm-hmm. made us believe are possible. And yeah, and the house has grown. It started as an event. It's evolved into a community of, of more than 30,000 people with more than 30 local chapters all around the world. Um, very vibrant community that is to a large degree, degree self-organized. And we we see ourselves as a, it's it's partly, I guess, a movement. I'm kind of careful with that term, but it's it's a, it's a, it's a community that is actually I feel like quite real now after six mm. years that has really grown roots and branches and has a real body. It's real. I think there's intimacy there as a main currency, but we also produce a lot of thought leadership. So we publish a lot, we do reports and we do a lot of client work. So we work with many fortune 500 companies and we help them envision a life centered economy. We help them map out what that might mean for them. And we help them most importantly to create events, experiences, and stories that mm. touch them, that really touch them on an on an emotional, uh, not only an intellectual and emotional, in a somatic, bodily level, and that's a key lever for change. So yeah, that's yeah, that's yeah. where we're at. Fantastic. 
You're listening to Beauty at Work. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by Templeton Religion Trust as part of a grant on the aesthetic dimensions of science. Templeton Religion Trust supports projects as well as storytelling related to projects that seek to enrich the conversation about religion. To learn more about them, visit templetonreligiontrust.org. This episode is also sponsored by the Institute for Advanced Catholic Studies, a global research center located at the University of Southern California. IACS works to create dialogue, spark ideas, and sustain academic research on Catholic thought, creative imagination, and lived experience. Learn more at iacs.usc.edu. If you're enjoying the show so far, please subscribe to our podcast and take a moment to leave us a review. Could you talk a bit about the the transition from human centered to life centered? Because I think I think that's that's one shift I've seen in your work. And 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 the other uh, thing, if you could touch on, is just just even if you could give one example of um, you know one of these organizations. You don't have to name the company, but just the kind of change that you've mm-hmm. been able to bring about in trying to create this sort of life centered business. Yeah, um, the human centered economy has been the the holy grail right for a while i mean it was like the lowest common denominator everybody could agree on human-centered products human-centered experiences ido the design firm that was a main rival when i worked at frog design that really did a remarkable job in promoting design thinking and and broadening the the remit of design Mm. uh also really famously propagated the idea of human factors right so let's start with personas let's look at the the human needs, you know, if you look at Maslow's pyramid of needs, of course, also maybe all the ones that are a little bit more subtle, the social needs that we have, uh, the spiritual needs that we have, and then design for that based on this premise that the human is at the center of all things. Uh, and that would inevitably lead to a more humane economy. The shift that, you know, that we have made, and I think the, the world is also making, if I sort of scan the world around me correctly, is that is this realization that that's just not good enough and has led to so many externalities, whether that is our mental health, um, you know, sort of this focus on we need to optimize our humanity in a way and bring Mm. most of our humanity and bring it to work. It has led to a lot of uh, disconnection and alienation from nature, from the other. Uh, It has led to the fact that I think convenience and comfort have probably been over-indexed when designing workplace and product experiences. And I think most importantly, of course, you know, climate change and the climate crisis and the damage that we've done to our natural habitat. And also, I think the disneglect for other life, you know, other species around us uh, is, has probably to do with the fact that we've, we've had this very human-centered, myopic mindset. So the life-centered economy goes beyond that. So as I said earlier, it acknowledges all life inside us So not just the positive emotions, not just experiences that are designed to make us happy all the time, but also Mm -hmm. workplaces that allow us to be sad and angry and inconsistent and complicated and and struggling because that's who we are and, you know, and hard to read and and unintelligible. And and then secondly, I think it's an economy that honors all life around us as in uh, heightening, expanding our consciousness being aware of the cycles of nature, whether that's the circular economy or designing work more in a cyclical fashion where there's moments of rest and harvesting and recharging and rebirth and grief, you know, as nature sort of tells us. Um, So I think those are, and and also I think a a, a renaissance of the spiritual and the physical, the somatic, like reconnecting with the soil, with the earth, with our bodies and the knowledge that it contains, not just the intellectual knowledge that we have in our heads and also with with yeah spiritual practices it's a word that i would not have used five six years Mm -hmm. ago it it didn't use it in my book now i feel like the world is the business world is ready for it and we see it pop up and i i just came back from a you ask about examples of work i just came back from a partner summit that we help curate and host and produce for a a big uh, talent search uh, consulting firm And they used human design. So human design is a framework that is based on Kabbalistic wisdom and other spiritual. It's a hodgepodge, a mix of various Mm. uh, practices. But essentially, it dissects and and identifies the energy types of people and then uh, helps leaders assemble teams and make staffing decisions and career decisions uh, and strategy decisions based on energy. 
And that's really interesting. It's, it's, it's more accessible than other spiritual practices, I think, because it has very practical value. But we, we see organizations use that. We did with a big car maker for which we ran a, a, a leadership session. We, we looked at auric cleansing. So looking at the energy in rooms and things that have happened in rooms before they entered and raising awareness mm. of energy as something that is hard to quantify, but it's there, it's present. And it, it, it's, a, it's a matter that, mm. that affects how we make decisions and behave in business. We, um, so we orchestrate longer term leadership journeys where we then bring in speakers and we create experiences. We, we go to interesting places. We push people gently out of their comfort zone. Um, yeah. and, but we also do interventions for like, we're, we're, we're actually doing one next week in London with a, a fashion brand where it's also a leadership development program where, uh, we're playing with AI and what makes AI, what could make AI more beautiful and things like that. So, yeah, I think it's all what we call experiential thought leadership so taking ideas that are uh, from disciplines that have been long neglected bringing them into the the arena of business but doing it in a very theatrical immersive mm. entertaining even uh fashion right so that it really is something that moves people yeah yeah no, no that's, that's that's fantastic when i started out um yeah, you know, I started out my undergraduate career wanting to be an engineer, like like most Indians who who come to the West. So, I, you know, I grew up in the Middle East, and I moved to to Canada for college, and then I started out in, in engineering. I quickly switched to business, mainly because I was interested in understanding why people worked and what what the, the questions around why work is meaningful and what does meaningful work look like. And so there were there were two kinds of questions there. One one had to do with with um, is there such a thing as meaningful work? And, uh, you know, in a kind of more philosophical sense, like what is what is meaningful about work? Is there a purpose to work and why do we do this? But then who does it and how do they do it? And those those questions led me to what was then, uh, you know, in the management literature, a burgeoning uh, sort of series of journal articles on spirituality in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And so this movement had started in, in the 90s and still is pretty alive in, in the management world and in the academy. But even then... You know, in the early 2000s, when I was doing my my undergrad thesis and so on, I was starting to see just a lot of concerns about the abuse of spirituality, right? So, so once you start to have companies leverage spirituality as as a means to success, as a means to productivity, um, there are all kinds of prospects for abuse. And I so I, I'm just curious to to know how you see that surfacing because it's 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 such an intimate and uh, sacred part of who we are and and a lot of people on the one hand want to be whole persons and they want to be really integrated and other people want more separation to say i don't want my company messing with things that are really important to me i'm just curious to see how that fits in in the work you do how those tensions emerge it's a real concern and it's one that we very often talk about and we're very aware of and this notion of bring your full self to work can be quite intimidating and it can be a tyranny, you know, of emotional performance, right? Where you're mm -hmm. now supposed to show up and you need to be vulnerable. That became sort of a thing, yeah. right? And it's almost yeah. like your performance is now measured on the grounds of like, are you, what, what, how high is your emotional intelligence, your social intelligence? You mm -hmm. know, can you be vulnerable? And if you're not, right. what is wrong with you? <laughs> you know, <laughs> which is ironic. And, so I think the key thing is here just to give choices. Not everybody wants mm. all of their desires and needs fulfilled by their work. They're quite happy with a 30 yeah. hour, 40 hour work week or less, you know, ideally less. We've, we've seen all the research yeah. showing that three, four day work weeks yeah. are quite conducive to, to better outcomes in business. Um, so I think that the choice is, is really important, but I think ultimately because we spend so much time at work, 70 75 percent i believe of our waking hours as knowledge workers i think the question is right so work if you define it as as an amount of energy devoted to something over distance the question mm. is how do you devote your what do you devote your energy to if not mm. work and what is work to begin with so it depends a little bit and i know this is a you know not everybody has this privilege of being able to even pursue the work that is purposeful and meaningful to them and have their energy yeah. and the time they spend match in the best, best yeah. possible fashion. But I think we should, if we can, within the confines that are inevitably there, we should, we should at least try. And I think what we're trying to do is just open up a possibility space 
So if people want to be more vulnerable, if they mm. want to experience emotional intimacy at work, uh, and, and by the way, we should also in this context mention the loneliness crisis uh, yeah. that's so blatant and outrageous in a way. And workplaces, of course, more than any other societal institution, I would argue, you know, with sort of the secularization of, of our Western societies, has they have the power and the, perhaps the responsibility as well to create intimacy. We know that intimacy is the antidote to, to loneliness, yeah. you know, and it doesn't even matter yeah. whether it's a, whether it's a very close relationship to a very close confidante or friend. What matters is the small moment of attachment as the, the marriage or relationship researcher John Gottman says, right? So if mm. you have a lot of micro moments of attachment and they're even with strangers, you have, moments of intimacy i think that can fuel you that can you know that can mitigate any any uh s sensation of of loneliness and loneliness also comes from the fact i think that that your energy uh, and who you are you know who you truly are is not really matched by what you do i think that is that leads to burnout that leads to stress that leads to trauma that leads to i think depression and to loneliness right also being lonely yeah. with your with yourself so we try to do what we can, but, you know, I think we're trying not to become cynical. So, of course, you can always instrumentalize. You can instrumentalize mindfulness. You can instrumentalize yeah. the, the types of experiences that we create and then say, oh, this is all great because it's going to make us more productive or it's going to help right. us make more money. And that's it. You know, whatever, whatever it takes. And if it's spiritual, great. You know, let's let's use it. And And that's, of course, a real pity. But I still think introducing these practices to business no matter the intentions in the beginning even if it's in the guise of enhancing productivity which is much easier for many managers to to make mm -hmm. a case for once it's yeah. there and once the value is recognized and once it's experienced maybe my hope is it'll take a life on its own and mm -hmm. and then it will develop so much momentum and force that this instrumentalism uh, this ut utilitarian mindset mm -hmm. you know might be overcome right so I think that's the hope that I have, at least. Yeah, no, I think, I don't think um, having workplaces where people feel sort of spiritually manipulated is a good thing. On the other hand, you, you yeah. have often workplaces that are rife with, uh, you know, loneliness, right? And, and that, that they're alienating and dehumanizing and that, that experience doesn't need to be there either. I know there is increasingly this desire, which, I mean, I think the... Uh, success of the the recent book, uh, the Good Enough Job, uh, Simone Stolzoff's book, I think speaks to the fact that people, you know, are realizing that maybe this pursuit of of work as as a be all and end all, the kind of workism, you know, the expectation that work should fulfill a, every aspect of my life is a bit, you know, it's not working. But at the same time, I think uh, that the alternative doesn't have to be that the workplace is really, you know, the kind of Taylorist, uh, you know, rationalist, alienating kind of workplace either, right? And um, I do think, though, that that like one of the things that occurs to me, and it's the same, not just in the workplace, but in the university, is that you have people coming to you who are really struggling with loneliness, with mental health challenges. and And part of it is that I think a lot of our social institutions have stopped functioning. Families have stopped functioning well. Schools have stopped functioning well. Mm. And so uh, we've recently been having some debates at our university as to whether, like, what is the purpose of the university anymore? Are we simply about a space where people download some knowledge into their heads? Or, or is this a space where people need to learn how, like, should we be spaces of hospitality? So I've been trying to, to think about what it means to create classrooms that are that are spaces of hospitality and encounter rather than just a place where you go and passively consume some knowledge um partly because i think people are not capable of learning unless those basic emotional needs can be met unless they can feel the mm -hmm. sense of psychological safety and that and that somebody here is invested in their well-being right mm -hmm. so i think even with work it's one of those things where i don't think you can really bring yourself and even if you're you're drawing rigid boundaries around work and saying I'm only going to work 20 hours a week or 30 hours a week and I'm not going to bring my full self and they don't need to know who I am you still need to experience uh, I think a sense that this is a space of hospitality where I am welcome um and I so, I so I'm just curious about the role of hospitality then uh but also about whether you see business as a kind of surrogate institution in some way in providing what um maybe other institutions and associations, you know, um, 
are supposed to provide, but those things don't don't exist or function very well. Families don't function well, or sports clubs don't seem to function well. And is that is it the job of business then to to, to provide that? Yeah, I mean, oh, there's, there's so much in your question. I think those are really interesting observations. The you know we when we like looking at our own team, many of our colleagues are Gen Z, you know, Gen Gen mm-hmm. Y. They have stopped looking for meaning only at work, right? Or the formalized mm-hmm. work. And many of them yeah. have very flexible set setups and they have passion projects on the side. They have a side hustle. Or, and it's not even, it's not even a side hustle. It's just another work activity. So I think the, the notion of work has become much more holistic and it's no longer tied to employment or to the one thing that defines you, that grants you identity that you do. And I think that's really important. It's also important that we do work even if we are not working. So, yeah. uh, you know, I'm, so I'm thinking of, for example, the whole rest movement, Trisha Hersey in Atlanta, the nap ministry and sort mm. of napping and, and, and resting as resistance to this mm. pressure of constantly having to perform and to advance your career and to optimize and uh, I also just I was just reading the the Prophet by Khalil Gibran and uh, his really beautiful letters uh, to Mary Haskell, and 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 she writes back to him and says, you know, uh, I want you to know that even if you're not writing, if you're not producing something, you're always working, right? So your yeah. silence and the the pauses and the times in which you don't work but reflect, they are your work, they are your mm-hmm. life's work, uh, perhaps even more than what you actually produce. Now. That's an artist, and that that's a very different life uh, life reality. But I, I do think that we need to begin to understand the, the right question to ask is what is our life's work? You know, how much of that is in mm-hmm. employment? How much of that is as mm-hmm. parents? How much of that is as a friend? Uh, as as you know, romantic lovers and partners. So, where you know, how do we manifest ourselves? And how do we bring what only we can bring to the world? That's the work we have to do. What the no matter you know, it can be various mm. platforms and, and and channels. And this brings me to the question you had about hospitality. Uh, mm. And this goes back to Priya Parker's work as well, who mm. asked this question, what does it mean to be a good host? She also asked, what does it yeah. mean to be a good guest? But right. since we talked about hospitality, what, and what what does it mean to be a good host? And it's it's a good question for business leaders and and organizations, not only for the customers in in relationship to the customers, but also their 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 team members and, and society at, at large. How can we be a good host? And what does it mean to create hospitality? Now, the one thing I would say about classrooms and at universities is that I think more than anything else, I would argue that yes, they need to be temples of hospitality and they need to create a sense of belonging. But I think that that belonging is not the same as fitting in. Um, mm. So belonging is probably quite the opposite of fitting. And it means that you can be who you are without the need to fit in and right. to attune. And, and I think the one thing that I appreciated about going to high school and then, you know, in my uh, post-grad or master's degree in, in Los Angeles is I think the one thing that school or educational institutions can provide is like th- there are spaces where we can learn to disagree. So I think mm-hmm. it's not just about, you know, validation, but it's actually like, yeah. let's learn how to fight. You know the good fight yeah, yeah, yeah. and and have and yeah. defend our views and and change our views and and battle and have debates and 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 learn to disagree respectfully and still uh, have a relationship to to someone who's maybe not like minded and we right. don't have enough of these institutions and so you know so I think that's really really important yeah. and I think I hope that we don't design that out of the system in an effort to produce functional employable individuals who you know are cocks in the wheel and work for the machine, but rather that we, we help people individuate and, yeah. and find their true selves uh, to then do what is their life's work. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's really brilliant. I mean, it's, it's so, so necessary in our polarized times. We don't, we want to sort ourselves into our camps, into our little bubbles where everybody believes exactly the same thing. Right. And, and we don't really know how to be with people who disagree. I was very struck by the festival that, you hosted the dream that was this year's festival of the house of beautiful business. I was only there for a day for about 24 hours. And yet I think that it was probably the first experience I've had in maybe some 20 years where I could um, quickly connect with complete strangers and, and really build genuine friendship. I mean, I've, I've made um, 
you know, some really wonderful friends there whom I'm still in touch with just from that one day. And I'm still in awe of, of what you guys did. Like, how did you create this experience? What is your secret sauce <laughs> or what are the, what are the, what's the principles? What are the kind of um, ingredients that, that go into, into creating something like this? I don't know what, what stands out to you as, as being sort of the, you know, the, 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 like what it would take for others to do something like this. Because for me, this, it was such a beautiful experience and, and I'm still in awe of, of, yeah, the, 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 the ability to create the context in which these kinds of, of genuinely human interactions and intimate connections can happen. Well, thank you so much, first of all, Brandon. That really means a lot. And, and thank you for coming over for one day from, from DC, I believe. Uh, that, that was quite a commitment. I believe at the end of the day, I can give you some specific beliefs that we have and experiences, but sure. I think at the, at the end of the day, I think it works because our heart is in the right place. Mm. And, and that's what people sense and the people who come, they come with genuine interest in one another, uh, not a mm. transactional agenda. And um, and there's a few things in which we manifest that or that might help create that kind of uh, context and, and environment. One is that, as you may have noticed, we don't have name badges. So mm. this isn't an effort to avoid that people look at their, their name, their badges, and try to figure out whether it's worth having a conversation with Brandon, you know, because he's not a CEO, like what is in it for me? And of course, that's, that's a real pity because often we discover things uh, or we, we basically, you know, uh, prevent ourselves from discovering things that are quite important and then strike friendship. So business is always a byproduct of our gatherings, but it's never the foremost purpose or mm. reason why people connect. They want to connect because they want to get to know each other and they're interested in, yeah. in different views. And we didn't have screens at the event um, we try to design times of decompression and nothingness where people mm. can just sit still and, and connect with each other and have longer conversations. We, we challenge their views. We inspire, we bring music, the arts, dance, uh, um, other experiences in, into the mix. And, but I believe at the end of the day, it's really the intimacy and it's this, the genuine intention of the people who are there. And this is also a community that has grown over six years. So, you yeah. know, this was your first time, but many people have been there for two or three times. Mm. Everybody's quite open. We want to be very kind. It's really important to us that it, we, this is a very kind community. They're very welcoming, very warm. And, you know, communities always start as, as uh, I think a famous sociologist whose name I forgot once said as, as pseudo communities where there's a mission and a, and a, and a th declaration of intent and shared values. But then it takes a while and usually a crisis or real challenges mm -hmm. for communities to become real, right? So they become mm -hmm. really uh, a body and, and, and vibrant and, and alive if they've gone through some crisis together and they've been tested. Mm -hmm. And we had some of these social experiments and we, COVID was a big factor in that regard. Yeah. You know, I really brought people together and helped us grow the, the community. Um, yeah, so that's the key question for us. How can we maintain that intimacy? And yet we want to also grow the community and scale it. And that, that of course, is, is an interesting tension. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it so? What is what does success look like for you in terms of this, or or what I don't maybe that's not the right word, but like how would you know that this is on the right track, or or that you've you've you know been been doing the right thing? Um, again, this sort of I don't want to make this a technocratic reduction to metrics of some sort, but there's this probably something you're trying to to use to gauge whether um, you're doing well. Other than you know maybe there's the growth is this is one aspect of it, I suppose. But how would you ultimately know that, yeah, this is really what we wanted to do and look, it's happening. It's, it's definitely the, the, the growth overall, right? So we look at, uh, mm -hmm. are we expanding our footprint? Are we, is there resonance in other markets? Mm -hmm. We're exploring actually going into a on different continent also with some of our events next, next year and, you know, beyond mm -hmm. Europe and the U S and I think that's, that's one thing. And we're quite enamored by, by these local hubs and just the amount of activities there. So that's a sign that, there's a certain stickiness and that the fact that people stay in the community and then sometimes, you know, they do less and they drop out a little bit and then they come back and become a little bit more active. That's totally fine. But mm. um, I think most people, once they're in the house, they, they value the connection. Uh, secondly, I mean, we do all this stuff like net promoter scores and we do surveys and we look at uh, whether that's in our client work or the festivals, uh, the festival that we create and the events that we create because of look at retention scores and satisfaction scores. Um, with 
with the client work and the work that we do inside organizations, we we look at repeat business. We are very keen on moving beyond the intervention. So once we we intervened and we staged one experience that we have champions in the organization that help us, um, yeah, just really grow our footprint there and influence them. And I mean, what I would love to see what my, my co-founder and I, and I think our community would love to see is just much more influence, right? Much more influence. So I think in, the, in, in a sense, we want to be a more recognized voice on our map, you know, let's take generative AI in the future of work mm. in light of generative AI. Can we develop a point of view? Are we a community that can bring some, something to the table there that is not part of the conversation yet, but that needs mm. to be heard? Can we bring the talent, like the very unique eclectic talent that is in our community, can we bring that into organizations in a much more concerted way? Can we infiltrate these organizations? Can we create more change makers and ambassadors within these organizations? Can we really become a movement um, that is producing very interesting, very unique genre defying work, you know, that will be remembered and that encourages people. I mean, I love this word courage because it comes from heart mm. that gives people the heart to, yeah, to live their, their, their business life differently and then themselves become more courageous and inspiring others. So it's, it's hard to quantify. We, we do have some metrics in place, of course, also because we have investors, we're a business, we want to grow. Yeah. We're quite ambitious. We're, we're, we're encouraged by the recent festival a lot. I think that was really yeah. great to see how people responded to that. Um, but, um, you know, the as I said earlier, I think the challenge is also how do we grow this without commodifying it and, mm. and still being very intimate and very special and also the sort of rebellious, subversive spirit that is also part of our, of our yeah. brand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think it's super important work y'all are doing because I think, you know, ultimately for a lot of people... You know the 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 temptation is is to make you know especially if you're in the business world to make everything around you know about profit and about um about success but business is a means right business is is a is a way in which you bring something valuable into the world in which you solve a problem and and I think that can be a, a means to also enhance our humanity to to bring that to the fore rather than than crush it and then too often i think I think when we you know, lose the, uh, you know, the, the, the focus and, 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 and get our priorities wrong. I think it ends up dehumanizing us. And, and, and that's, um, a lot of what we're seeing, I think, in, in the work world where people, instead of making profit of the, uh, the, the means it, it becomes the end. And then it, it, it starts to, you know, lead us astray. Uh, talk about your new book. I mean, what are you working on and, um, uh, what are you hoping to do? It's been, I mean, it's just been such a struggle, Brandon. Uh, it's oh, one right. of these projects that had a lot of false starts and it's a difficult birth, which also shows me that it's, it's funny. I was, I was, uh, I was recently at dinner and I said, you know, this book is just not going to come to pass. I don't know what it is. I just don't have time for it. I never find the time for it. Mm. And, that, and that person got basically turned to me and responded and said, no, it's, it's basically, uh, you know, it's not you're not ready for it, that the ideas may be out there. Yes, yeah, it's not the time thing. <laughs> and I think, I think both is probably true. Um, it's a difficult birth and the book is about mysticism and management. So in a way, it's a continuation of the journey that I started with the business romantic. There, mm -hmm. I delved into the romantic world and the world of exuberant and unquantifiable emotions as an added dimension, as an un uncovered dimension, uh, un under covered dimension of business. Even that now strikes me as maybe perhaps too shallow. So I think what I'm now interested in is like, let's go even deeper into what I mentioned earlier, sort of the, the subconscious, the the unconscious, the spiritual side of our being, um, really the mysterious mysticist uh, aspects of our being. And there's so much knowledge in that. And I, what I've observed uh, also to the work at the house and the people we curated is that there's really been a trend towards that. And I think what I'm struggling with, quite frankly, and I'm, I'm working on the proposal now, I've interviewed a bunch of people and I'm just creating a body, like a table of contents and some drafts, but it's been really going on for almost like one and a half years now. What I'm struggling with a little bit is that I'm not naturally like, you know, I'm not, I'm not really engaging in these practices. So I'm more of a keen observer who's very curious mm -hmm. about them and interested in them. And so I think I'm struggling a little bit with like, is how personal I want this book to be? Is it a mm. reportage? Am I just calmly 
observing what's happening and interviewing people. And I do think because it's been such a difficult birth that, that there's something like I'm going through this like transformation and it is, it is a very personal project. And so huh. it, it needs to be, it needs to come out, but I think I probably needs a bit more time. Yeah. Hmm. 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 Wow. Wow. Well, thanks for sharing that. And, and, and I do hope that it comes to fruition because I think it would be, <laughs> well, it'd be so very too, important. Right? And I yeah. think whatever, whatever journey you're on, I think will, will benefit all of us. So um, <laughs> well, we'll see. yeah, yeah. Tim, thank you so much. I'm so, so grateful for, for, uh, again, for this interview, for this conversation. And it's been such a pleasure getting to know you a bit more. Where can we direct our viewers, our listeners to your work and, and to what y'all are doing? The best destination is is the house of beautiful business website so www.houseofbeautifulbusiness.com google it subscribe to our bi-weekly newsletter called beauty shots that's a good window into the the house community join one of our online sessions uh yeah read up on us and come join us you know come to our one of our events fantastic the door is open of the house uh, always yeah, I highly recommend it. Do you have a, a tip of some sort for, for any of our viewers and listeners who might want to infuse more beauty into their work life or, or to make their, their, their business more beautiful? One, one point that you could leave them with? Uh, two points. So one would be uh, just take them, take your team and, and uh, take them to some, like take them to a concert, a movie or a theater play and then let that sink in. And then talk about it, you know, take the time to talk about it. You'd be amazed how such simple endeavor will actually open up new perspectives and actually change the relationship you have. The second tip I have is silent dinners. We've done many silent dinners with clients and there is something so powerful about dining silently for 90 minutes with colleagues or strangers, not saying a word, but actually connecting on a very deep level. Like everything will change after that. I promise. I promise you. So those are fairly easy to pull off uh activities that i highly recommend wow that's that's i used to i used to when i was an undergrad i used to visit a monastery to get to get a break from you know to yeah get a break from my studies and and they would it was an instituted practice that that the meals would be silent and it was it was quite an experience every time so fantastic thank you tim really grateful thank you so much brandon it's been, been a pleasure Hey everyone, thanks for listening to this episode of Beauty at Work. Please be sure to check out our show notes for more resources from our guest. And if you like this episode, please be sure to share it with your friends. And please leave us an honest review. We'd love to hear what you think, and it helps to get the word out about our show. Music for the show was provided by Venkat Subramaniam, and the podcast was edited by Dave Visaya from Podcast Engineers. And thanks again to our two sponsors, Templeton Religion Trust, and the Institute for Advanced Catholic Studies at the University of Southern California. For a research project on beauty and science, visit wellbeingandscience.com. To learn more about our broader project on beauty at work, visit beautyatwork.net. Thanks again, and see you next time.